bucket going around. I want to thank two more specific groups of people that I had. Uh, the first one would be our, our children's workers, the volunteers who are up there with the kids right now. Uh, they are the unsung heroes of our church because we have a lot of children, starting with my family. Uh, and those guys have been volunteering every week. They do a great job of providing a world-class environment for our kids so they can learn about Jesus. Uh, we really want that to be the best hour of the kids' week. And so they're doing everything they can to make that happen. So if you see a, a children's worker, and, and Sash is in the back today, but there's some up there as well, uh, tell them thank you. Tell them how much you appreciate it. And if you have kids and you'd like to get involved, uh, we'd love to have you as well. And then the second uh, group of people who I want to do thank are those of you who are inviting your friends and family because uh, obviously people are being invited. And so we, we really appreciate it. Uh, that's how the gospel spread. It's one conversation, one contact at a time. And so thank you guys for partnering with us, for investing in your friends and family, and, and inviting them to Impact Church. Uh, and on that note, if you need any help with that, we have some invest in light cards at the table, uh, which make it easy just to hand somebody a card uh, with the information and all the details on that. All right, so I've taken enough time talking. I'm going to get started here and want to start with a quick audience participation, wake you guys up. Uh, a little bit. So how many in the room, uh, just raise your hand real quick, are excited that Jack Bauer is back killing bad guys on TV? Right? Got a couple? Okay. That's what I'm talking about. The rest of you guys are ungrateful because you don't even know how many times Jack Bauer has saved your life. The man has diverted nuclear catastrophe more times than I can count. I, I really, I am so thankful that he's back on TV because uh, I really, I use TV as a, a release. I enjoy watching Jack Bauer mindlessly shoot and kill stuff and never be harmed. It's amazing. He's a talented guy, Jack Bauer for president. Uh, but here's the thing. Uh, it can be a, a bit of a time suck sometimes, TV. How many of you understand this? The worst is when you're up late at night and it's time for bed or past time for bed. And there's just one of those movies on. It seems like they hold off the good movies until like 11 o'clock at night because uh, my bedtime's pretty late anyway. And then, and then there's a movie on TV that you just can't not watch. And so I came up with, with a list of, of what my can't not watch movies are. And it starts with uh, The Shawshank Redemption. Doesn't matter how many times I've seen it. If I'm flipping through the channels at 11 o'clock at night and The Shawshank Redemption is on, I'll stay up till 2.30 and watch it. And it's a long movie. Uh, I've got some others, though. I'll be tired for work because it's that good of a movie. Here, here are my others, and, and don't laugh at them. Some of them are, are guilty pleasures, probably. Uh, the Breakfast Club. Can't not watch The Breakfast Club. I don't know how many times I've heard every speech in that movie. I could probably quote it, but I won't. Uh, the, uh, the Goonies, Sloth, that's a classic. If it's on TV, pretty much have to watch it. Inception, that's a newer one, but if Inception's on TV, even though I own the DVD and I never watch it, if it's on TV and already queued up for me with commercials, I'll watch it. And then the last one, I think I had one more on my list. The last one, and, and I probably shouldn't admit this, Roadhouse. If I see Patrick Swayze roundhouse kicking people to the head, I have to watch it. And I've seen it hundreds and hundreds times. I really wish they would play the good movies during the day, but that's another discussion. So I was thinking about that, though, and it occurred to me that I probably watch a little bit too much TV sometimes, especially on those nights where I stay up longer. And I was looking, according to Nielsen ratings, they, they do all the ratings for TVs, uh, or for TV entertainment, all that. They say that the average American at this point in history watches 35 hours of television a week. Now, maybe... Uh, when you hear that, you think like I did immediately, no, they're, 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 uh, there's somebody else who's watching like 60 hours who's bringing the average up, because I don't really watch 35 hours of TV a week. And then I started counting, and I was like, Monday and Tuesday, uh, yeah, like 35. I'm probably in that, I'm probably in that ballpark. The, those Nielsen guys know what they're doing. And it got me thinking about it. I was thinking 35 hours of television a week. I didn't even go as far to calculate that for the year. But do you realize that 35 hours of television, which is what the average person consumes in one week, is more television than, than you're going to hear messages from Impact Church throughout the course of a year? 
I've been averaging over the last five months. I'm, I'm a dweeb, so I went through and like added it up and divided and stuff. I've been averaging 33 minutes a Sunday, which is probably a little bit too long, and I, I'll work on that. I'll try and bring it down. 33 minutes a Sunday, I'm speaking. Over the course of the year, 52 Sundays a year, assuming all of you are going to come every Sunday, which is probably a long shot, that comes out to be just under 29 hours a year of teaching that you're going to get from Impact Church. And so I was thinking about that. And as a church, it really, this sort of thinking impacted us as a church. When we started, uh, we kind of considered that and we factored it in. And so it, it really um, impacts a lot of the way that we do things around here. And so one of those changes is that we don't really see Impact Church, we don't see Sunday as the end all. It's not the win for us. It's not the goal. As much as I love to come together, as much as I love to hang out, to drink some coffee, to meet some friends, to worship God together, hear a message, celebrate communion, all those things, they're all great. It's not me. Uh, but the reality is, that's not the win for us. Because on Sunday, you're going to spend about one hour out of a typical week here. You're going to spend about one hour in a community of believers like this but in the whole week, there's 168. So, so I, I'm not a good enough speaker. I don't have enough confidence in myself to think that 33 minutes of my time is going to impact your 168 hours to the level that it needs to. And so what we did, we really planned with that in mind. And so we want Sunday to be an encouragement for you. We want Sunday to be a place where you can come, where you can get spiritually kind of filled up and then sent out into the rest of the week, that the rest of the week we believe it, it's far more important what you're doing the other 167 hours than what you're doing while you're here with us. And not to sell it short, we love, we love Sundays, but the reality is what you do the rest of your week is far, far more important. Okay, so I'm going to be moving in uh, to, to, to my message here, and, and I want to start with this quick illustration. And you can, if you, if you don't mind, Close your eyes for a second so I can paint a, a little bit better picture. Imagine this. Imagine I, I walk into my, my house, and some of you know my wife. She's a feisty little Italian lady. And, and I walk in to my house, and I say to her, I am, am starving. I'm starving. And she looks at me, and I obviously I look a little pale, a little gaunt. Maybe my stomach is distended, and you can see my ribs, and, and clearly... It looks like, man, this guy has not been eating. What's wrong? Eh. And my wife, she might say to me, what in the world is happening to you? And can you imagine if I said to her, if I said, I I'm just not getting fed around here. Nobody is feeding me. What's, what is, I'm starving. Nobody is feeding me. Do you know what my wife would say to me in that situation? It, it probably would be much more harsh than this, but, but essentially she would say, feed yourself. You're an adult. You can do it. We've got instant food. We've got a microwave. There are lots of opportunities to feed yourself. And this is a, a far-fetched illustration. It's kind of ridiculous. But here's the thing. That conversation in the church world happens every week. Every week there are people who leave churches uh, who are doing a, a great job. Some of them not as great as others, whatever. But there are people who leave churches every week and would say, the reason is because they're not being spiritually fed. They're not, they're not being nourished enough in their church. And, and maybe sometimes that's true. But if you've been in the church world for any length of time, it gets thrown around a lot. And it's not always necessarily true. And there's some truth to the reality that if you're an adult, you can feed yourself. And so that's, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Last week in our first week of this Spiritual Growth for Dummies series, we talked about uh, prayer. And we said the, the big idea of this series, the main thing that we really wanted to drive home over the next four or five weeks, and actually, uh, a quick plug, in our fifth week, we're still planning on doing Q&A. So if you guys have any questions about spirituality that you would like to be answered, just shoot us an email at info at impactchurchohio.com. And we're going to answer that. And if you guys don't give us anything, I'm just going to talk about something random. So it's really, if it's bad that week, you only have yourself to blame. Uh, I totally lost my train of thought. Okay, so we're talking about prayer. And the big idea we said is that spirituality or spiritual growth is intentional. It's not accidental. 
It's like wearing a seatbelt or, or getting in physical shape. It's something that you have to work for it to work. It, it only works if you work it. And so today we're talking about Bible reading, and, and I want to stick with that same theme that it, it's intentional. It, it's not accidental. It's something that you have to do. And actually, Bible reading, we're going to call it uh, self-feeding. And, and stick with that self-feeding. Feed yourself. There's access. If you're going the other 167 hours a week expecting to come here for one hour on Sunday and to be spiritually filled up and spiritually nourished, uh, you're setting yourself up for failure. You're setting us as a church up for failure because, honestly, we, we can't do it for you. And we want to help. We want to try. We want to resource you. But we really see Sunday as, as sort of a, a pit stop or a refueling station that can send you out. And then the rest of the week, uh, you're on your own. And what you do during those other six days is far more powerful. Even I mentioned the kids area. Uh, we try and do everything we can to make that as exciting, as relevant for the kids as possible so they can learn about God in an age-appropriate environment. And amen, so that we can learn about God in age-appropriate environments away from the kids for at least an hour. But the reality is if your kids are only hearing about Jesus for one hour on Sunday from, from a stranger up there, you're setting them up for failure. They're going to become a statistic. They're going to drop out of uh, church when they graduate high school like a large portion of kids do. They need it more throughout the week. Kids can recognize, they can sense consistency. All right, so uh, in, in one of the largest studies of spiritual growth ever done, this study called Reveal, it was by a big church called Willow Creek, uh, an amazing church, do lots of great things. They did the largest commission study on spiritual growth. And what they found was that uh, reflection on Scripture is by far, uh, over two times, more influential uh, towards your personal growth than any other practice you can develop. So if there's one thing that you could do that would yield the highest return, spiritually speaking, or, or in your spiritual growth, it would be this. It would be consistently reading your Bible and self-feeding. And so that's what, that's what we're going to hammer on today. Uh, turn in your Bible, or if you have a mobile device, to John chapter 1. And if you have version on your phone, you can click the little live button. We have all our notes online. You can follow it. Uh, there's some poll questions. If you have prayer requests, anything like that, we'd love to connect with you on there also. And uh, the, the Bible, I, I don't want to overemphasize it as a book. Anybody can read it. But I believe there are some tips that, that I've experienced or that I've learned along the way that I, I want to share with you to give you guys tools and resources because I think it will help you go uh, further faster with your Bible reading. And we've only got a half hour. So in the sake of time, uh, I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about why you should read your Bible. But then the second half of this, uh, I really want to talk about some practical tips and some practical tools that are going to help you do it more effectively, more efficiently. Uh, and if you're a visitor here today with us, maybe this is your first time, you might be thinking, oh man, what did I get myself into? He's going to be talking about Bible reading. I don't even believe the Bible. Just a bunch of dead guys who wrote it, put it all together. There's mistakes in it. Everybody says those things. And, and if that's you today, uh, I really want you to pay attention today because this is your opportunity. Here, here's the deal. I believe this uh, with everything in me. I believe that if you read your Bible, you're going to experience consistent and ongoing life change. And, and if you're here and you're skeptic about that, uh, I would challenge you to, to, to test me on it. You know, take the next... Uh, 21 days, we said, to form a habit. Take the next 21 days, 15 minutes a day, read the Bible. If you're skeptical, what do you have to lose? At the end of a month, you can check this Christianity box off your list and, and go your merry way and say, you know, I tried it and it didn't work for me. But I believe that if you do this consistently, 15 minutes a day for 30 days, 21 days, whatever, that, that God's going to honor that in your life, that he's going to change your life, and that you're going to notice, you're going to feel a, a marketable difference in your spiritual growth. And so I, I, would, I would lean into that if, if you're having that hesitancy, if you're thinking about it. Lean into it and, and accept the challenge. Yeah, unless you're not confident in, in your own beliefs. Because I, I believe I am confident and I would challenge you that. Anyway, uh, John is the fourth gospel. It's one of four eyewitness accounts of the life and times of Jesus, and, and it's chronologically the fourth one we find in the New Testament. So 
you're in your Bible, halfway through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay. And it says this in chapter 1, starting in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The Bible sometimes is so poetic. Uh, it's just a really well written. But right off the bat, what you notice is his language here. Even if you're not real familiar with the Bible, kind of echoes uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. The very first line in the Bible says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And so when John's writing this, he's trying to take your mind back to that place and saying that in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, he goes on to teach a little bit more theology uh, going down. I'm going to end on chapter or verse 14. And he says in, in verse 10, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. And, and then he concludes down in verse 14 and says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, so we ask ourselves, what is John talking about? What is this word? Or, or more accurately, who? And I, I'll tell you today, he, he's talking about Jesus. It says, and, and you can do this exercise, in the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was Jesus. And, and the Word, or, or Jesus, was God. And, and the Word, or was with God. And the Word was God, and, and Jesus was God. He was in the beginning with God. And, and maybe... Whether it's your first time or whether you've been in church every Sunday for your life, you've probably heard this book, and mine's an iPad right now, but this book, this Bible, you've probably heard it referred to as the Word of God. And here it's saying that Jesus is the Word of God. And so it's, it's a little confusing. Is Jesus the Bible? Like, how does that work? And, and here's a, a brief but sort of technical explanation. We would say that Jesus is the incarnate Word of God. It comes from uh, this Greek word incarnate. It's like chili con carne, like with flesh, okay? So Jesus is like God in flesh. He's the incarnate Word of God. If you want to know what God says, look at Jesus. And, and the Bible, we would say, is the written or, or the revealed Word of God. And so the Bible, if you want to know about God, read the Bible. It's going to tell you about Jesus. It's going to tell you about God. This book that uh, teaches us about Christ, it, it reveals God to us, and it's living and, and active. In fact, Hebrews uh, verse, or chapter 4, verse 12 says this, uh, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and, and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So, so Jesus is the Word of God, and, and the Bible is the Word of God. And when you connect with either one of those two, when you connect with Jesus, when you connect with the Bible, it's going to uh, sort of cut your life. It's going to connect with your life. It's going to change you. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It, it divides the soul and the spirit. When you read the Bible, or if you read the Bible, this crazy thing happens where the words begin to speak to your life in ways that you didn't think were possible, in ways that you wouldn't understand otherwise, because it, it, it cuts like a knife. And, and as you read, the Holy Spirit illuminates the words on the pages so that uh, the Holy Spirit begins to do this thing that I consider like spiritual surgery, where it's like he's, he's cutting out parts of your, your life or, or sin or 
bad behaviors, whatever, uh, bad personality traits, things that are, are harming you in your life, things that are bad for you, the Holy Spirit kind of like, he, he pokes at them and he, and he cuts them out and performs a spiritual surgery so that you become better, you become changed for, for the better, for the future. The words begin to come to life and, and Jesus begins to prune things out of your life and, and sometimes it's, it's painful or it hurts, but, but like gardening, we know that when we prune things, we kill off uh, maybe good things so that better things can flourish and grow. So I asked, uh, like, what kind of sick masochist would do this to themselves? What kind of sick person would, would read the Bible, would want to bring sort of this pain or this surgery into their life? And, and really, I think it's somebody who gets to a point in their own life where they realize that they don't have all the answers. And what they're doing Monday through Friday, the other 167 hours of their life, isn't working for them. It's, it's not helping them to, to become the person they know they can be. They feel something off in their spirit. And... And it's not helping them to accomplish. So, so when you reach the end of yourself, that's really a perfect time to reach out to God, to, to connect to something greater than yourself. You have to reach the end of yourself to find a solution elsewhere. I want to look at one more verse, and then we're going to talk about some practical stuff. But this next verse is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. And since I'm skipping around, we'll have it on the board. Uh, you don't have to get there unless you like to quiz yourself or something. Um, and and this, is, this is what I would consider sort of a memory verse. It's something that maybe you have a pen or paper. You want to write this one down. Put it on a mirror. Put it on your dashboard. It's just something good to, to know. All Scripture is God-breathed uh, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good week, work. It says the scripture is, is breathed by God. And you go back to Genesis again with this one, that when God spoke creation, Genesis tells us he, he spoke the words and light came into, into creation. And he spoke the heavens and the earth and he spoke the animals into existence. He breathed into man. The scripture is breathed by God in the same way. It's his spoken word. And, and, and when his word speaks, it, it creates, it teaches, it reproves and corrects and trains us for, for righteous living, for lives. And, and last, it goes on to say that it equips us for every good work. So that, that was a lot and kind of covered a lot of scriptures, 30,000 feet view of why we, we should read the Bible. Those are some scriptures that they tell you that the Word of God is God and that the Bible reveals God to us, it reveals Jesus to us, and that as we read it, that we'll be changed. Sorry, I have a sinus cold. Uh, that we'll be transformed into the likeness of Christ, that we'll be moved forward spiritually, that we'll grow spiritually. And so that's, that's why we should read the Bible. We should read it to grow. And, and here's a confusing thing. Uh, if you've never read the Bible before, or maybe if you don't have a habit of doing it now, you might approach it like a Tom Clancy novel or something, and you think, I'm going to start in the beginning and, and work my way through 10,000 pages and hammer this thing out this summer because I'm on vacation. And the Bible isn't, isn't necessarily a, a typical book. It's really a collection of, of 66 books, and they all deal with different aspects or different genres. You have literature and poetry and um, apocalypse and some other stuff like that, that that's all in there, and you have eyewitness accounts but it's not, it's not a typical book. You're not reading for information. It's not trying to figure out, oh, I hope I don't see the last page because I don't want to know how this puppy ends. That would be a waste of 10,000 pages of reading. You're, you're not reading for information. You're reading for application. You're reading to see, what does the Bible say that I should do? What does this story have to, to say about my life? And when you begin to apply what the Bible says, you're going to begin to experience transformation. That, that application leads to transformation in your life. Did you know, uh, over the course of an average day, and I don't know why I have so many weird statistics in this, this message this week, but bear with me. Uh, over the course of an average day, the average person makes 300 decisions a day. And so most of those decisions are really trivial, like where am I going to park? What am I going to eat for breakfast? What am I going to wear? 
do these shoes look good with this outfit? Uh, that's more of a lady decision because I don't care. Uh, but as long as my feet are covered. But throughout the course, there are going to be one or, or maybe two decisions a day that you make that really have some, some long-lasting implications for your life. There are going to be decisions that you make maybe seasonally or quarterly, monthly, I don't know, that have implications for your kids, for your family, and could change the trajectory of your life for years to come. And when you make those decisions, uh, here's what happens in your brain. You're going you're gonna to draw on past experience to try and make the wisest decision that you can. It's like putting a bucket in a well. You're going to put a bucket in the well deep inside yourself, and you're going to try and pull out the right answer. And when you do, I pray that that well is filled with the wisdom and the guidance of Scripture and of God so that you can make wise choices, so that you can make decisions that will honor God, that will lead you forward and not backward, that won't cause you more harm than, than you need to go through. But the only way that's going to happen is if you're, if you're self-feeding, if you're filling that well regularly, consistently with, with the Scriptures, with the Word of God. So, uh, the, the, that's what it looks like. You know, that's the rationale biblically. But on Monday morning, wh what do you do with this? How do you read your Bible? What does it look like? If you've never read your Bible, I want to start at square one. We said this series, it may not be for the person who's been in church their whole life. You may get nothing out of this, and I'm okay with that. Because we want to talk to the people who, who are new to faith. We want to talk to the people who would say, man, praying for five minutes a day, that's a big step from where I'm at. That's progress, and we're good with that. We want to help you on that journey. And so reading the Bible, uh, we want to start with 15 minutes a day. And, and if you're like me, you probably ask yourself, where am I going to get the time? I've got four kids. I've got a job. I'm already stretched to the max. We've got soccer practice, all this. Just think back to that five hours of TV you're doing a day. It's there. It's there. We, ha we all have the same amount of time. And, and the reality is we, we make the time for the things that we think are important. And so the hardest thing, it, it's not finding the time, it's convincing ourselves that this is important enough to spend the time doing it. And I hope you get to that point. I, I hope you realize that. I hope something I say connects with your spirit and you say, you know what, I've tried everything else, but for the next 21 days, I'm 15 minutes a day. And, and here's a couple ways you could do that. Uh, pause the TV. It, it, that's like the way they do commercials. 15-minute segment. Just pause for one commercial. I have DVR. If that doesn't connect, just turn it off. Just turn the TV off. Get crazy. Uh, redeem your bathroom time if you have to. 15 minutes a day. You can do it. You can do it. Lock the door. Get the kids out of there. Whatever you need to. Read the Bible on your lunch break. You can do it. You can eat and read. If you have Uversion, if you have a mobile device, you don't even have to read it now. Technology is amazing. You can press a button on there. It'll read the Bible for you for 15 minutes. Do that. Do it on your commute. Just find a way to make it happen. All right, I'm going to suggest three tools that you need to start self-feeding today. And if Wes would help me out, we have... And there's a slide also. And the three tools are going to be this. You're going to need a Bible, a pen, and a journal. And maybe you've never journaled before. Try it out. See what happens. It's more of a men don't do it, I know. But you realize it is beneficial. And the, ben the real value of journaling is that you're going to be able to look back at your prayers. You're going to be able to look back at God's faithfulness and say, hey, at the beginning of the year, I was praying that I wouldn't get fired. And, and six months later, I got a promotion. How does that happen without Jesus? You're going to have benefits. You're going to be able to look back and track God's faithfulness. And when you have those wins in your life, spiritually speaking, you're going to grow because it's going to empower you. It's going to embolden you in your faith, and you're going to continue to take more faith risks, and you're going to develop trust for God because of that. So Bible, journal, and pen. And then today, sorry, I uh, want to take away all the excuses from you. So here's what I was thinking. If you need a Bible, we'll give you a Bible. If you need a journal, we have some back there. And we may have enough for everybody, but if you need one, take one. It's at the connection table. We'll give you one. If you need a pen, steal one from the seat back in front of you. There are lots of pens. And, and honestly, you guys paid for them, so it's not stealing. Unless you didn't pay for them, in which case it is stealing. 
but it's for a good cause, so we're okay with that. Take a pen. You're going to have a Bible, a pen, and a journal by the time you walk out of here so that you don't have any excuses. And, and here, we have this acronym we want to use, or maybe acrostic. I get this too confused. I think they're the same thing. We have an acronym, and it, it's called SOAP. If you look at this card in front of you, I'm just going to read it a little bit. You can take this with you, be able to remind you, paste it in that journal if you need to. And, and what I want to say is it, we can all agree that it's good to use soap every day, right? We can all agree we know people who don't use soap every day. We know people we've all sat by somebody. Don't raise your hand or point if you're sitting by them now. But we all know people like that. And, and we can all agree on the front end that it's good to use a little soap every day consistently, time to time. And so what we want to say is that use soap daily. And what is soap? Uh, soap is a method of Bible reading and journaling, and it stands for this. S, scripture. O, observation. A, application. P, prayer. And then you can just use it with any Bible reading plan if you have version again. They have plans on there. You can get a plan to read the whole Bible in a month, or six months, or a year, or seven years, or only on days that end in S. I don't know if there are any of those. Whatever. You can get all sorts of plans. There are so many resources. You can Google it and find a billion things. Pick one. Start somewhere. Here's the thing. When you're trying to make changes, when you're trying to grow spiritually or, or in any area of your life, the important thing is to start small, but, but to start now. Start today. Whether it's a chapter a day, a verse a day, a passage a day, a book a day, I don't care. Just read more than you are now. Remember, we're worried about progress, not perfection. And this is probably a good time to remind you, if last week we challenged you to pray for five minutes a day, to take this 21-day prayer challenge, that it takes 21 days, sociologists tell us, to, to develop a habit or a pattern which we believe determines our behavior. So if you've bombed for the last week, no, there's no condemnation or shame. Pick up tomorrow. Try it again. Do it again. Start from here. You have a fresh start today. Five minutes a day. Pray. And here's the thing, we're going to ask you to do 15 minutes of Bible reading using soap, but you can tack that five minutes on, so it's still 15 minutes, we're not asking you to do 20, that'd be crazy. Uh, so just tack it on, the N, the P is prayer, incorporate that as your prayer time, and move forward. At the end of a month, at the end of 21 days, when you have a habit of prayer and, and Bible reading, you're going to grow spiritually. That's just how it works. So S is for Scripture. And this little card is going to give you just a basic synopsis. I'm going to read it. I, I know you guys are all smart people. You can read it, but sometimes hearing it from another voice might be helpful. Uh, open your Bible to today's reading. Uh, take time to read and allow God to speak to you. Remember, it's his word. It's his spoken word. Uh, when you're done, look for a verse. Uh, narrow it down just to maybe one verse that stood out to you, that spoke to you that day, and write it in your journal. If you look at the other side, there's sort of a sample of what a journal entry might look like. It has the SOAP deal. Oh, observation. What struck you or stood out or caught your attention about what you read? What do you think God is saying to you in that scripture? Ask the Holy Spirit to teach and reveal Jesus to you. And then maybe paraphrase it or write it down. Uh, there are some scriptures that sound really weird in King James, and so you just might write, don't be stupid. I think Jesus is telling me to stop being stupid. And that might be the most beneficial thing a lot of us could do, me personally. Uh, a, Application. Personalize what you've read by asking yourself how it applies to your life right now. When the Bible was written, he was speaking to specific people with real problems who were looking for real solutions in their time. But, but the beautiful thing about the Bible is that we believe it applies to all times. But sometimes you have to look a little bit and say, okay, here's what it meant to them, but, but what does it mean to me? What does this mean to a white 30-year-old with four kids, uh, you know, living in Lakewood, sort of suburb of city, whatever we are. What does that mean to me? And that's going to make all the difference in your life. Write down how you can apply the scripture today. And then P, prayer. Uh, this can be as simple as asking God to help you use the scripture, or it may be greater insight on what he is revealing to you. Remember, prayer is a two-way conversation, so be sure to listen to what God has to say. And then, and then maybe write a, a brief synopsis of your prayer. Today I'm praying for God to help me financially float. That's all I need for this week. I just need to make it to tomorrow, make it to payday. Okay, we've all been there. 
And maybe we are there now, some of us. And the other day, again, when you get the other side, that's what it's going to look like. And if you take a journal, if you do this for 15 minutes, you're going to have seven, of these, three of these, two of these a day, whatever. It's going to be more than you're doing now in some cases. And if that's the case, that's a win. That's progress. That means you're making steps towards Jesus. And we want to celebrate that. And if you're already doing more than this, if you're like Bible scholar and you're doing half hour a day and you're killing it and reading Greek and whatever, uh, show me what you're doing. I don't know. Um, but we would encourage you to do that. This whole series, uh, we're going to keep challenging you to be intentional. We're going to keep challenging you to get intentional about your spiritual growth 